Scriptures teach that we are baptized into Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, uh, were baptized into His death. <clears throat> In Galatians the third chapter, verse 26 and 27, tell us, For as many, for all, for ye all are children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. <clears throat> Being in Christ, one of the blessings that we receive of being in Christ is becoming a new creature. As Paul would mention in St. Corinthians 5, verse 17. <coughs> when, <coughs> when he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What a beautiful idea that we have in Christ a new life. And so we began noticing some of, these th some of the things in this new life. The first is that we have new relationships. We have God as a father. He was not a father to us before being in Christ. If anyone had the right to be called from the standpoint of a spiritual father, it would have been Satan. Uh, as Jesus expressed, he likewise is a father. And those Jews that he was speaking to in John 8 and verse 44 were of their father, the devil. Well, we now have God as our father. We have changed from that old relationship to a new relationship. But also, we have a new relationship with Christ. <clears throat> He goes from being just a good individual who gave some good moralistic teachings to the idea that he saves us, he saves me, and a personal aspect that Christ loved me and gave himself for me, as Paul puts it in Galatians 2 and verse 20. We also have new relationship to the church. We now have fellowship with the saints, all of the saints all over the world that are faithful. Paul, <coughs> John wrote that we would have fellowship with God and with one another in 1 John 1. And that fellowship, of course, brings joy, verse 4. Well, we have fellowship thus with God and with the saints. We're now members of that same family of God, the church. And being members of the, that same family, Paul would encourage us to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And thus, in that relationship that we have to those who are in the church, we bear one another's burdens. What a wonderful idea that we can bear one another's burdens. Now, there are certain personal responsibilities that no one can do for us, but there are a lot of areas in which we can encourage and we can aid and we can build up and we can bear one another's burdens. <clears throat> we also have a new relationship to the world. No longer the friend of the world, as James says, that's adultery and adulterers. Uh, <clears throat> being the friend of the world, that if you're the friend of the world, you can't be the friend of God. And so we're now changed from being a friend of the world to being a friend of God. John would put it in 1 John 2, <clears throat> verses 15 through 17, that we're not to love the world. So that love of the world, the desires of the world, and all of that appeal that the world throws at us, we have shunned that. That no longer appeals to the Christian. We have become the friend of God. We love God. Our affections are to be there and not on the things of this earth. And as a result, the world's going to hate those who are Christians. And 
even as they hated Christ before us, they're going to hate us. And we're going to be exposing their error, which makes it all the worse as far as they are concerned. You know, if we're just over there to the side and we never bother anyone, we don't uh, challenge their thinking, then they're not going to care. But the Christians out there, he is reproving the world. He is exposing their error. And thus the world hates them. But also we have that relationship where we try to save them. We are to go out into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And thus our relationship to the world, while at enmity with them, it is our duty to try and save them. But we're also going to have a new rule of life. <clears throat> this really boils down to the idea that there is a throne that's in your mind. That throne is that which is going to control your life. It's the rule of your life. And the question then comes, who's on that throne? Are we going to put Christ on the throne or are we putting ourselves on the throne? Self... <clears throat> with all of its passions, all of its pride, is really putting Satan on the throne. If you look at, <coughs> at the philosophies of this world, it all boils down to, in reality, self and Satan. That that's the way people live. You look at hedonism, for example. Hedonism very simply means pleasure. Some seek after pleasure. They think that pleasure is the ultimate goal. Well, even in that they have difficulty. Should it be immediate pleasure or long-term pleasure? Those two are not always the same. What might bring immediate pleasure might not bring long-term pleasure. If it's pleasurable to me, does that mean that it's automatically pleasurable to you? Which one should I seek? Which one should I do? My pleasure or pleasure for the most people? Or should I base it upon society and pleasure that bring, what brings the greatest pleasure to the most people? You say, I really can't answer it. But in reality, all of this is I'm putting self on, on the throne. I'm going to seek my pleasure because really that's what boils down to those who would say that we should seek the greatest pleasure or the greatest number. Why? And there's no reason. And so it really goes back to whatever brings me the greatest pleasure. That's what I need to do. I'm putting self on the throne. It's all me. Humanism is much the same way. They got over to the question of ethics, morality, and they said all ethics is situational and autonomy, autonomous. If you look at those two statements, those two statements are contradictory. If it is situational, it cannot be autonomous. If it's autonomous, it's not situational and cannot be. But yet they tried to mix the two. Situation just says, whatever the situation is, then based upon that situation, we decide what's best. Well, who decides it? Is the situation based upon self, or is it based upon someone else? See, they, they can't answer that because they don't have a standard, except for Satan and his rule within their life. If it's autonomous, that very simply means self-ruling, self-governing, that I'm going to govern myself. And whatever brings me thus, and what I want to do, that's what I should do. And thus, if I want to take a rifle and go shoot up a crowd of people and kill a bunch of them, well, that's what I should do because that's what I want to do. That's what's going to bring me pleasure. 
there's no basis upon which them, for them to say, that's wrong. Not if he's doing what he wants to do. And ethics are autonomous. It's based upon, for him, what he wants to do. And if he wants to take a gun and shoot a bunch of people, that's what he should do. Now, they don't like the consequences of their doctrine, but in reality, it all goes back to following the ways of Satan instead of following the ways of God. Why? Because they have put self on that throne in their mind. Self becomes all important. That is really the basis of humanism. That is, self is all important. We are gods. In fact, Human Manifesto number two that was written back in 1973 basically states that very fact. We're gods. We don't look for a God in the sky. We are gods. We control everything. What is it? I'm placing myself on that throne in my mind, and whatever I seek, whatever I want, that's it. That's Satan. Paul would state in Romans 6 and verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye shall obey it in the lust thereof. <coughs> yes, there's sin. And he says, don't let sin reign. What is it? You've got a throne in your mind, and you're either going to allow sin to reign there, that is, in all of its various forms and factors, whether you want to talk about self, whether you want to say Satan, whether you want to say sin, it all boils down to the same thing. They have taken God off of that throne, and now then sin is reigning within their life. In Ephesians 4 and verse 22, Paul would tell them to put off the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. In other words, here's that individual, that old man that he's talking about as opposed to the new man in Ephesians 4. That old man, he's walking according to deceitful lust, the lust that he has within his life. He's placed self on the throne and he says, I'm going to live for self and those things that I desire, those things... And that's really what lust is. It's a desire, sinful desire, or obtaining it sinfully. And I'm going to put that on my throne. That's the deceitful lust. And he says that's corrupt. That's the old man. Why? Because you put self on the throne in your mind. In Romans 13 and verse 14. <clears throat> He tells us put, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. There again, the lust of, of self, the flesh, the things of this world. And it's saying, I am going to place myself on that throne and I'm going to do what I want to do. And he says, you take that off and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul puts it to the Galatian brethren in chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 in this way. Thus I, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Notice that last statement. You cannot do the things that ye would. Why, that's putting self on the throne. That's what he's talking about there. Here's the things that you want to do. You can't do those because that's contrary to the will of God. You've got to take self off of that throne, not do the things that you would, and now walk in the Spirit. The idea of walking in the Spirit is to walk according to the things of God. 
that which has been revealed in the Spirit, by the Spirit in the Word of God. You walk that way, not putting yourself on that throne and doing the things that you want to do and fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And so we have, in reality, we have to place God upon that throne in our mind. That God becomes the, the king in our life. That he's going to be the rule of our life. That I'm going to submit myself, my will, my passions, my thoughts, my actions, everything in my life, I'm going to submit to God. And not myself, because I'm not going to do the things that I want. It is truly letting Christ be Lord of our life. In Acts 2, as Paul preaches this sermon, and in this sermon, convicting or proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that they had by wicked hands taken and crucified the Son of God. And in doing so, he now comes to the conclusion in verse 36 and says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word Lord very simply means master or ruler. What is it? God has made Christ ruler. He is truly the ruler the king, the king of kings and lord of lords, as Paul described him in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. But the question then comes, is he lord of our life? Do we allow him to be lord in our life? God's made him lord, but do we allow him to be lord within us, within our mind? within our thoughts, within our actions. Now that was said to the Jews, to the Gentiles in Acts 10th chapter. He says much the same thing in verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Now in the context there is dealing with Jew and Gentile, but he's Lord of all, everyone but we can reject his lordship within our life and put ourselves on the throne instead of of him. But he's still Lord. We've just rejected that lordship within our life. In Romans 14th chapter, as Paul was dealing with Christian liberty, he says in verse 8 and verse 9, for whether we live we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. We are the Lord's. We belong to him. He is to be on that throne in our mind, and we are subservient unto Him. The Beatitudes in Matthew, the fifth chapter, as Christ begins those Beatitudes, He begins with the very fact or the idea, blessed are the poor in spirit. That individual who recognizes that I'm not going to place myself on the throne. I need God on the throne. I need God control. I need Christ controlling my life. We started out talking about uh, hedonism and humanism. And in reality, all of the other philosophies that you might think of in this world. And 
in reality, they have no purpose, no way in which to say, this is why you should do this. You should live this way. Why? There's no reason that they can give. Why shouldn't they, based upon the life that they are living and that which they have placed as king within their life, just do whatever they want to do? And that includes, yes, the person going out, getting a gun, and start, starting to shoot everyone. Now tell me, based upon that philosophy, why should they not do that? What should prevent them from doing that? They have no answer in reality because they have no basis for it. Except, well, you know, it, it didn't bring pleasure to that person who got shot. Well, it brought pleasure to the one who shot him. So why shouldn't he do it? Well, it's against societal norms. Well, why should he submit to societal norms? He wanted to do this. Why shouldn't he do it? There's no answer. But when you place God on the throne and you realize, I need someone to guide me, to direct my life, that I can submit to, that knows what is best for man, you place God upon the throne... Well, then you have a reason to live a certain way. And you have something to look forward to in the time of death when it comes and when Christ comes again. I should live this way because, number one, it is truly the best way. God created us. He knows us. And thus, I should place God on the throne in my life. He truly can be Lord. He, his principles that he sets forth as to the way in which we live, they're the best for us. Man doesn't always know what is best. In fact, Jeremiah states that, that the way of man is not in himself, it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And yet man tries to. What man needs to do is place God upon the throne in his mind. And that produces a new view of life. But there's also a new view of death. Man's reaction to death is basically fear. It was stated that uh, there's some mm, certain millionaires that you don't even say the word death around them. Don't ever want to think about death. You'll find even today people who refuse to go to, example, a funeral because it makes them think about death. Man's reaction, that's man's reaction. This world is all that there is to them and that death ceases that. Because to them... There is no afterlife. There's nothing after this life. This life is all that there is. Thus they ought to live for herself here because when death comes, that's it. There's no difference between them in their mind than an animal. Why do you think that they can... Think about protecting all of the animals more so than even humans. There's a fear of death because there's uncertainty involved in it. An uncertainty, they don't know what's going to happen other than just ceasing to exist. The Christian reaction is far different than that, though. You have a new view of death. That view is that it's not the end of life. In Philippians, the first chapter, Paul is discussing this idea. 
And if you start in verse 19, Paul has been placed in jail. He's going to be appearing before Caesar Nero, who could put him to death or could release him. And he's simply, for example, in verse 18, he's rejoicing that Christ is preached because some individuals thinking they could take advantage of the situation, uh, they preach Christ, but it was not out of sincerity or love. It was out of contention for Paul. But Paul says, I'm just thankful that Christ is being preached. And he says... uh, In verse 19, For I know this, uh, that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my life, whether it be by by life or by death. Paul is there going to stand trial. And he says, my earnest expectation and hope, his expectation actually we find in the next few verses is going to be released. But it doesn't matter to him. Whether I'm released or whether I die, Either way, he says, Christ is going to be magnified in my body. I'm going to magnify Christ no matter what the outcome is. And so, verse 20, he says, For me to live is Christ, but then notice this, to die is gain. Now, to that person who's not a Christian, that concept is totally foreign to them. That death can be a gain? No, death is the end of life. It's the end of all things. Everything that I've worked for, everything that I've lived for, all of the things that I've accumulated in my life, they're gone. Doesn't make any difference now. Solomon, in long ago, in the book of Ecclesiastes, faced the same thing. It goes through one thing after another after another, all of the things that this world had to offer. And he says, all of them are vanity. They're worthlessness. They have no value. Why? Because he didn't have God in his life in reality. So what was death? It was something to be avoided, something not even to think about. It was fearful. And here's Paul saying, death is gain to the Christian. And he goes on, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot or know not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But then he adds, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Here is life, death. Either way, Christ is going to be magnified in my body, whether I live, whether I die. But then he says, death is gain. And then he says, it's far better because death separates me from this world and allows me to go and be with Christ. And that, he says, is far better than even magnifying Christ here upon this earth in his life. And so here you have life, you have death, and he says death is far better. Now a person in the world can't say that. They don't have that concept because it's not far better for them. And just as an aspect of this. You know, how many times do we hear Christians talking about a non-Christian who has died and we say, rest in peace? No, that individual's not resting in peace if he Christ- wasn't a Christian here upon this world. He's resting in 
not resting. He's in torment. He's in pain and anguish. He's suffering the fires of hell. Read about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. That's not resting in peace, and yet that's his situation. That's a miserable situation, one that we should do everything within our power to avoid. But Paul, for the Christian, says death isn't like that for us. Death is our ability to go and be with Christ, and that's far better than even serving Christ in this world magnifying Christ in, this, in our bodies. The psalmist in that great shepherd psalm of Psalm 23, in the fourth verse he mentions, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So here is death itself. I can live in such a way that death doesn't cause me terror. It doesn't cause me to be afraid. I will fear no evil because God's with me. He's going to protect me. He's going to care for me. And yes, when death comes, I can then go to be with Christ. The angels will come as they did the rich man and take us into Abraham's bosom, where we can be with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, there were those at Corinth who were saying, there's no resurrection of the body. And so the entire 15th chapter is really dealing with that doctrine and those individuals. And he shows that it, if there's no bodily resurrection, then Christ was not raised, and everything that we have, everything that we do is in vain, and it's worthlessness, has no value. And we are of all men most miserable, most to be pitied. But God raised him from the dead. And now then, that resurrection assures us that we likewise will have a bodily resurrection. He has become the first fruits of them that, that are raised. But he comes to the end of the chapter now in this entire discussion. And he asks the question, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian has been given the victory. They are victorious. What's he talking about? He's talking about death. Here's death. To that person in the world, death is victorious over them. Because they have nothing now. In reality, they have an eternal torment that they will be in. But to them, they have nothing past this world. To the Christian, there's no sting of death. He has a victory over death. Because Christ was raised, we will be raised. And thus, Paul's statement, for me to depart and be with Christ is far better because it allows me to go to be with Him. What a wonderful joy that we as Christians have, because we have a new view of death. Not something now to be feared, but now then something that we can be victorious over. And it will give us the ultimate aim of our life. Our aim is to go to heaven to be victorious. And death allows us to escape the things of this world and to be able to go to be with Christ. If that's not your state this afternoon, then obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Become a Christian through your faith. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as the Son of God. Let us baptize you in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And in doing so, those sins are washed away. You become a Christian. 
and you have that new view of life and death. If you've become a Christian, but you haven't allowed Christ to truly be Lord of your life, and you realize this afternoon you need to repent and come back into Him and once again submit your life unto Him. And why not do that and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of your sins. And thus enjoy that life that Christ has laid out for us with the end eternal life in heaven. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.